The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to a Standard Bank webinar hosted by Standard Bank SPFC, which is our financial consultancy. My name is Ketiwe Wegunene. I'm the coordinator today. Um, and in light of Women's Month, which is August, we decided to have a session to look at financial planning for women. So for the gentlemen out there, this will also be very good information to share with your female colleagues, if you have daughters, your wives, your mothers, any female in your life. And I'm sure you can add insight to this as well. So that's why we decided to have this in light of August month, which is Women's Month. Um, and to show that we want our men to participate as well, we've got two panelists, a male and a female. And the male you might know very well. If this was a radio station, he'd be known as our resident jock. But uh, today he's our esteemed panelist, Mr. Errol Mayer, which you all know very well. A certified financial planner, admitted advocate of the High Court SA. He's written many articles, financial planning articles. He's authored a book called Notes on Estates and Financial Plans, uh, which is prescribed for many universities. He's previously worked as an ex-tax advocate for SARS, and he currently holds the position of senior manager, which is advisory propositions at Standard Bank. And his co-pilot, equally as important, equally as uh, beautiful, sorry, Errol, beautiful is also good for men, you know that, right? Her name is Faiza Khan. Faiza graduated from Vets Law School with an LLB degree and from the University of the Free State with a postgraduate diploma in certified financial planning. She's currently studying for her master's in financial planning law, very impressive. She joined Liberty after her brief encounter at Momentum as a litigation attorney. She previously worked as a financial advisor as well at a Liberty Agency. And Faiza actively engages in teaching and research on estate planning, retirement planning, and business planning. So this is going to be a wonderful session today. I can't wait. But before we start, I just want to run through two situations that I want you to be comfortable with. The first one being sound. Um, if you can hear me before I hand over to the presenters, I just want you to indicate to me by clicking on your small hand, which is a small high five. It's on the panel on the right hand side of your screen. So if you click on that for me, um, I'll appreciate it so that I can see that the sound is good and that we can carry on. Okay, thank you, Rosina. Thank you, Tandy. I see your hand. Thank you, Rose. I see your hand. Pumza, Marubele, Nomvuyo. Okay, lots of hands coming up. So I guess everybody is comfortable with the sound. Um, second thing, if you have any questions, please do type the question in. There's a small questions box on the same panel that you found your hand. It says questions. You type in your question, but we won't disturb the presenters during the presentation. At the end of the session, then we'll address the questions to Faiza and Errol. Hope that uh, makes sense to you. The first person that's going to go ahead today is Errol Mayer. He's going to start it off for us, and then he's going to hand over the baton to uh, Faiza Khan. Mr. Errol Mayer, thank you very much. I'm handing over to you now. Thank you, Kati. Well, good day, everyone, and welcome to our Women's Financial Planning Webinar. In this webinar, we pay tribute to all women who are making a contribution to our daily lives in all spheres of life. It is without a doubt that women in general have made great strides in their financial contributions to this world, simply because of their uniqueness and behavioral characteristics they are rapidly making an enormous difference in the financial world and in my opinion taking some leading steps when it comes to financial planning well let me start at the beginning and explain my thinking and thereafter i wish to explore some lessons that we can take home from our observations but these are will in the second half of the presentation take us through some practical aspects of financial planning now we all encounter many life events on our journey through life. Some events are predictable to some extent, whilst others are not. We all grow up as children, start a career, enter into partnership relationships, get married, have children, retire, and eventually we all die. Leaving our heirs behind to fend for themselves with the life skills we have taught them. All of us, men and women, go through similar journeys but not exactly the same, which allows us to plan for the foreseeable future and some people even plan ahead for the often unforeseeable, such as getting divorced, suffering a trauma event, looking after their aging parents, etc. Now somehow the world
position that women have moved at a faster pace and taking on many of the roles that was predominantly that of a man many years ago. Now, this has necessitated many new skills and especially financial planning, which has to date not deserved the fair attention by many women. However, it seems that women have adapted far quicker and more successfully than men. Women today are not only the primary caretaker for their children, but transform a role to participate in the financial world once dominated by men. All, all of this has changed dramatically the last 33 years. I, for one, can tell you that my dentist and my house doctor are both women and so by choice. Can someone explain to me as a 55 year old born in an era dominated by males why I feel safe when I see a woman pilot flying the plane on these many flights that I take? 50 years ago, many men were just distrustful. Now, did you know that women 33 years ago had the same status as that as minor child in South African law? In other words, she was not even regarded as a taxpayer in her own right. Yet the income of a married woman was deemed to be that of her husband. Therefore, many men argue that they don't want their wives to work because it would increase their taxable income and it was simply not worth it. Well, guess what? Th that was perhaps a lie and one wonders if the real reason was not because men felt threatened that perhaps had something to do with the male ego and how things has changed in such a short space of time. Now, However, having said all of that, I get the impression that many women, to some extent, still leave many financial planning decisions to their husband or lifelong partners, especially the long-term financial matters such as the retirement and paying off the bond in the house. This is perhaps because tradition is very deeply rooted in our society and stems from how we were raised. But first, this is what one woman had to say. Now, let's have a look at the next slide. And it says, we women don't care too much about get, getting our pictures on money as long as we can get our hands on it. Well, that sums it up and goes to the heart of the different values in life relating to money matters, differentiating between man and woman. Now, in the next slide, let's go to the next slide. We see that there's a picture of a husband and wife during the early Roman days. Now, let's go back in history for a moment. Roman family law was based on a principle that the father of the family, referred to as the pater familias, had complete authority both over the children and his wife. This was defined as the paternal power, or known in Latin, patria potestas. Up until 1984, we had the marital power in South Africa as opposed to the paternal power. The marital power was reserved in respect to the financial decisions of women. This is why the married woman was not regarded as a taxpayer in her own right. This was the last hindrance to freedom for women to be removed from South African law. Now, interestingly, the wife in earlier Roman law days held the following positions in the household. The wife is the property of her husband and completely subjected to his disposition. He could punish her in any way, including killing her or selling her as a slave. As far as family property is concerned, the wife herself does not own anything. Everything she or children inherits belongs to her husband. Now, in later Roman time, this absolute power of the husband was gradually diminished, leading to what we know as the free marriage, husband and wife, which they could agree upon. However, even in this new situation, the husband had the right to make the final decisions in all questions concerning the family, for instance, a place of residence, which the wife had to share with him, the education of the children and exclusive rights on her wifely duties while the husband himself could court other women with impunity. As stated before, the last remnants of the marital power was abolished only 33 years ago in South Africa in 1984. Therefore, the total liberation of women has moved at an incredible speed of development in the last three decades. However, as stated before, I believe that women and money matters are still often in evolutionary phase. And believe it or not, women are starting to make more sound financial decisions than men. It is inevitable that we see more divorce cases since money and values are closely in the world. When values clash, conflict arises, and so we see more divorces taking place. Now let's go to the next slide and make use of a practical example and see the conflict because of the different set of values men and women have. Now, it becomes necessary from a financial planning point of view to evaluate 
how the values of men and women differ. It is often these values in life that reflect in the way we deal with money. Money is the way how we engage with the outside world. These values will come to the forefront when we do financial planning, since we are talking we are about our financial goals in life. So why do people get divorced? Often you hear it is about money disputes. The reality is that money reflects our inner values and help us to achieve our why in life. If the woman feels that money should primarily be used for a child's education or swimming lessons, and the husband feels that the luxurious car is more important since he is the breadwinner and should uphold a certain status, the scene is set for conflict. The husband may argue that since the whole family depends on his income, it is important that he takes steps to advance his career and therefore must be seen by others being successful. Mommy, on the other hand, puts the interests of her children first. How do we solve this problem? Simple. Agree on financial goals. Budget, allocate them into order of priority. Look at the time frame to reach a particular goal. And since it does not have to be one or the other, prepare a financial plan with the financial planner. And all parties work together to reach these goals. And so you take the journey together to financial freedom. This is financial planning, folks. You can even say to your marriage, but serious, we at Standard Bank call it goals based financial planning. It is without doubt true these days that women are having a tremendous impact on all spheres of life, economically and politically. However, when it comes to personal money matters, I feel that there are some lessons to be learned by both genders. Firstly, the financial planning industry often directs its marketing campaigns to men and sometimes to a lesser extent to women. We are all unique, and that uniqueness also resembles itself between men and women. However, in all fairness, this is changing rapidly. But think about it, women tend to live longer than men, have their own unique medical issues, and remains the primary caretakers of society, takes maternity leave, etc. Secondly, when it comes to a divorce, women often comes at the worst off, often because of the responsibility of the children that remains with her. Maintenance payments are not always a true reflection of the actual cost for a child. A divorce event often creates the ideal circumstance to start with these effective goals-based financial planning for a divorcee. Now, according to a recent article in Personal Finance, women associate wealth with security and economic stability. Family well-being comes before personal interests. Can it be said that wealth for many men means primarily something else, such as status before family well-being? Well, you be the judge. Very interesting. The article states that women do not want to hear about the growth and comparative performance of different funds. They want information about reaching their long-term goals, which makes them perfectly suited for professional goals-based financial planning. It is no longer just about being pink. In this webinar, we will explore the financial and estate planning issues that has particular reference to women and her journey through life. But, let, but first, let me just share with you a fundamental financial planning truth. Next slide. And it says, if you educate a man, you educate a person. And the next slide. If you educate a woman, you educate a family. Now, this is all from my side. I'm handing you over to Fahiza to take us through some financial planning fundamentals for women. And then Fahiza and myself will be available at the end of the webinar to take some questions. Thank you and over to you there, Fahiza. Thank you, Errol. Um, welcome, everybody. While Errol was talking, I was thinking about living in the, the, the old Roman Dutch days. And I think a lot of women that I know, myself included, would have probably ended up in our graves if we lived back then. Um, I'm very glad that we live in an era where we are free and we can make our own decisions when it comes to financial planning. So I think the question begs, if we are able to make decisions in respect of our financial planning, why don't all of us do that? Um, Let's just take a look at some statistics. So if we think about um, when women age and by the time they're 64, for argument's sake, 
25% of women will be by themselves. They will be single as a result of either death or divorce. Um, how many women manage their own money? 80% uh, of women manage their own money now. However, 20% of women don't because they are the only ones that don't have to. The 80% at some time or another will be in a situation where they will have to manage their own money. If we look at retirement plans and savings, how much money do women save? Well, they only save 5% of their salaries, whereas men save 15% of their salaries. And if we look at widows living in poverty, 80% of them were not poor before their husbands passed away. Those statistics are extremely frightening. And it's very important that we as women take charge of our financial well-being. And it is never too late to do that. So if we look at investing for argument's sake, a lot of women don't take the time to learn about investing and how to grow their wealth because they either lack the interest or they are too intimidated or they think that their Prince Charming will do it for them. So they don't take those steps to ensure that their financial security is taken care of. And if there is some sort of a crisis and a woman is forced to take the reins in respect of the financial well-being of her family, it might be the first time that she is doing that. And then she doesn't have the knowledge and the know-how and the experience to do this. So it's important that while you are in a relationship, whatever that may be, that you learn how to take care of your own financial well-being. Don't wait until it's too late. Okay, so there's a financial planning circle that I would like to take you through because a lot of the time, you don't really understand what this financial planning thing is. And it could be quite daunting or you, you haven't found a financial advisor that maybe meets your needs as a person. And I think that's step number one. You need to find that person that is a financial planner that understands you as a woman and understands what your needs are. Um, because women are, are quite emotional and, and they need someone that understands the emotional side of financial planning and not someone that will, will, will be a product pusher, for lack of a better word. You need someone that looks at your needs and addresses those needs by providing a solution that could be a financial product. Let's look at budgeting. Okay, so what is budgeting? Does it mean that you can't buy the things that you need because you have to rather save all the money that you have? No, not at all. That's not what it means. It just means that you need to look at what it is you earn and what it is you need to pay for expenses and how it is that you can use your salary or your income in order to allocate that income to different aspects of your life, your financial life. Okay, so you need to look at how much money is available. You look, need to look at where that money goes and you need to look at how best to allocate those funds, okay? You can't become the dad in the cartoon um, that says that after taking a closer look at the budget, he has to let go of two members of his family. I hope that it never gets to that point. So start early. Um, you're never too young to start financial planning. As soon as you get employed, it's important that you meet with a financial advisor, interview them if you need to, Find one that meets with your needs and start this planning process. But before you do anything from a solutions perspective, you need to ensure that the budget is done. Okay, let's look at savings. So that's another aspect of financial planning. Okay, what is savings? Savings is essentially... Um, Part of your income or your salary earned that you do not spend. Now, a lot of people think that by saving money, you're not allowed to touch it, and that's incorrect. So there's different sorts of savings. Um, so your short-term savings is generally money that you put aside 
And you know that you have access to this money without incurring certain penalties that some products might have. So you put money aside that you can access in the event of an emergency or should you start painting and you need to buy paint or um, if you want to go on a, on, on a holiday at the end of the year, you can easily access that money and you don't have to worry about being penalized by the product. Um, this type of savings must be low risk because if you are accessing funds over the short term and you are invested or you're saving in a high risk type of product, if the markets tank, you're going to suffer a loss. So it's important that you that you save in a cash type of investment so that when you access it, there's no it's not linked to um, the markets and the JSE and stocks and whatnot. OK, the next step is investing. So a lot of people think that saving and investing is the same thing, but it really isn't. So savings is for short term um, expenses that might come about. Investing is over a longer period. Now, what we found is that women don't invest as much as they should be. Um, and a lot of women are just cautious. I mean, if we look at this graph, you can see that 42% of women are cautious when it comes to investing. So even if they are investing, they might be investing in low risk, conservative type products or portfolios and not in your high risk um, equity type portfolios. Now, if you have a long term investment horizon, it's important that you invest in equities as opposed to cash because over the long term, equities outperform other asset classes. Um, but because women don't have that experience, they're a bit scared and conservative when it comes to investing. However, um, if we if, uh, well, not if, when women do start investing and they become familiar with investing, they sometimes do better than the man investor, investor because they, they're just a bit more intuitive, they're not um, impulsive when it comes to making uh, investment decisions. So the more that we encourage our female clients um, and our friends and family members to invest, and and maybe gain some knowledge about investing and what that means um, you will see that they will the investment products will like more likely grow better than a man's investment product because a man's decisions is generally based on ego and sometimes they are overly confident okay so it's important that whatever we do that we make informed decisions and that we trust the financial advisor that is giving us advice or that we choose the one that we do trust so that when it comes to making investment choices we can rely on the advice that they give us so in order to get to financial freedom because that's where we want to go with this um, men and women when they when, when they are sitting down with a financial planner and they are thinking about financial planning as a whole, they are doing their budget, they are saving, they are investing. The whole point of this is to get to financial freedom where you don't have to rely on your children to look after you when you are aged because you haven't thought about your retirement planning for, for argument's sake. Or when there is a situation and your tire pops for, for example, there is a slush fund where you can access money without having to um, forego paying a certain debt because you need to rather buy a tire. So it's important that all of these puzzle pieces are in place so that we can reach financial freedom. Okay, how do we look at protecting the wealth that we create and more specifically protecting ourselves as an income producing machine? Because that's what we are. We produce income. We go to work. First we study, then we go to work, then we earn an income. And we are now in a position to look after our families and our children. But are we protecting that income? Are you protecting yourself? If we look at um, certain stats again, um, and more specifically uh, Liberty Life's um, insurance book, the risk book, 
one in three female clients that hold a Liberty Life policy that is insured for dread disease cover has claimed under the cancer category for breast cancer. It's no longer your older females that are that are susceptible to cancer. Cancer has no age. It has no um, race. It affects all of us. It is no longer something that is taboo. Um, we, are no, we are no longer speaking about people that you, you know, your, your aunties, friends, cousins, sister that has cancer. It's now so, so, so common that we're speaking about our parents, we're speaking about our sister, we're speaking about our grandparents. It's someone that you know you are directly affected. So it's important that you realize this, um, men and women, and that we ensure that we take out the correct risk cover to cater for those possible eventualities. Um, and that goes the same with um, with disability cover. It's important that if you're ever in a situation where you, God forbid, become disabled, that there is cover in place um, so that you at least have that income. Let's have a look at um, retirement planning. So generally speaking, at retirement, you need about 15 times your annual salary to cater for 80% of your, of, your, of your current salary during your retirement stage. So you've got to save tons of money to be able to just look after yourself when you retire. And I think a lot of us nowadays, we, we realize the, port, the importance of retirement planning because if we look around again at friends and family, there are a lot of parents that we, we have that haven't saved for retirement. And there's now a sandwich generation that exists where there are people that are, that are employed and that are working and that are earning an income and they are looking after their parents and their children. And these people are not able to save as much as they need to for their retirement. So it might just be a vicious cycle. So it's important that somewhere down the line, something has to give so that we can start saving for retirement. And as a woman, it's even more important because generally speaking, women outlive men by approximately seven years which means that we need seven years more income than a man does. And if we go back to the slide with the stats, we are only saving 5% of our salary, whereas men are saving 15%. Surely there's a disparity there. Okay, so how do we, how do we defeat this retirement obstacle? What do we need to do? And I think the first thing that we need to do and we need to advise clients especially is that should they leave employment or they are retrenched, whatever the case may be, it's important that their retirement funds um, that are available in the company fund that they worked at, uh, either pension fund or provident fund, that those funds are now preserved. If you preserve those funds, then you don't have to start again to try and catch up all the money that you've now spent. Remember also that if you don't preserve and you, and you withdraw that cash, then that cash is taxable, and it's taxable on the retirement lump sum withdrawal tax table, which is a harsh tax table. You would rather wait for retirement so that you can withdraw, withdraw lump sums based on the retirement lump sum retirement tax table, which is a lot more lenient. Um, and there's also a built-in penalty when you withdraw from the withdrawal tax table before the retirement lump sum retirement tax table. So it's important that you speak to a financial advisor before making those decisions. It's also important that from an RA perspective that you maintain those retirement annuity contributions. When times get tough and people look at their budget to see what can go, normally what would happen is that the DSTV subscription stays and the retirement annuity and the life policy gets canned. And when you when when you're doing financial planning, when you're serious about financial planning, that decision would not be a decision that you would need to make. You'd know what needs to stay and what needs to go. So I think in short, you just need to understand what your retirement needs are, 
and you need to plan carefully so that you can fulfill those needs eventually. Okay, let's look at estate planning. And a lot of people don't like to look at estate planning. They don't like to speak about bills because it's a hard conversation. It's a, it's a reality check. We realize at that point that we are not invincible. That something can happen. Something can go wrong. And have we planned? Do we have a will in place? Um, is it a valid will? Have, have you sat down with your financial planner to discuss what needs to go in that will? Have you done your estate planning? I think that that is very important. And um, let's go into the reasons why that is important. But when you are doing this will, it's important that there are certain formalities in terms of the Wills Act that need to be met. If these formalities are not met, then there is a chance that your will would be invalid. If your will is invalid, then the master of the high court will reject that will. And what will happen is that your estate will go in terms of the Interstate Succession Act. The Interstate Succession Act is um, a piece of legislation that dictates who your heirs are. So you don't have a choice if you don't have a will and uh, who you would want to leave your, um, your estate to. The Act will tell you who to leave your estate to. And I don't think any of us want to be in that position. We want to at least, at least have a say on how we want our estate to be dealt with upon our demise. So your will must be handwritten or typed, those wills that you see, the, the DVD wills that you see on Days of Our Lives, that's, that's not a valid will, unfortunately. It looks all glamorous and, you know, it's a beautiful room and a mahogany table, red carpets, but it's not valid. So it must be in writing, either handwritten or typed. Your will should be dated. Um, if your will is not dated and there are previous wills that exist um, or and there's no revocation clause on a will, then all of those wills that you have will be read together. So a revocation clause basically is a clause that says, I revoke all previous wills that I've done. If you don't have that revocation clause on your will and your wills are not dated, then it's very difficult to see which is the last will, which will you are revoking. And then in that situation, what will happen is that the master will have no choice but to read those wills together as far as possible. Your will must also be signed. Okay, You as the testator or the testatrix for women must sign your will. And if you can't sign, then you can sign by using a mark or an X. If you decide to do that, then a commission of oaths must also be present to verify that it is you, your identity, and that you are the person that has signed this will by using a mark or an X. Um, witnesses are also important, um, and when you sign your will, witnesses must be present because they are there to ensure that they are witnessing that you as the testator or testatrix is the one that is signing this will. They don't need to know the contents of the will. They don't need to know who is inheriting. In fact, your witnesses should not be benefiting at all from the will. If your witnesses are benefiting from the will, they will not be able to inherit. So it's important that you get people that are not associated with that will to draft the will and to sign as witnesses in order to ensure that there are no complications upon death. Okay, let's move on. And um, divorce, how does divorce impact a will? So I think a few decades ago, divorce was a little bit taboo. Now it is commonplace and people generally aren't as admin focused as we should be. In fact, we procrastinate, which means that if there is a divorce, the chances of us changing our will soon after are slim. And the impact of that is that if you pass away within three months of getting a divorce, and you have named your ex-spouse as an heir to your estate, if you die within the first three months, then it will be deemed as though your ex-spouse has predeceased you and he will not inherit. However, if you die after the three-month period, then what will happen is that 
your ex-spouse will inherit because three months is sufficient time for you to have changed your will and if you didn't change your will within those three months then surely it was your intention for your ex-spouse to inherit so whether you are in a situation where you have been divorced where if you are going through a divorce or you have clients that are in that situation it is very important that a new will is drafted after divorce unless it is your intention for your ex-spouse to inherit your estate so what are some good reasons to have a will like I said, we want to avoid the Interstate Succession Act dictating who our heirs are. I think that is that is very important. Uh, in terms of our law, we, we are allowed to have freedom of testation. So let's all just exercise that. Um, the other thing that is, that, that is extremely important is that if you are drafting a will and you have minor children, you have to make provision for a testamentary trust in terms of that will. Because any benefit that accrues to a minor child in terms of your, your will or your estate will be held in the guardian's fund. So all those assets must first be liquidated and then held at the guardian's fund. The guardian of the child must then claim maintenance from the guardian's fund, which is quite a tiresome process. But if you have set up this testamentary trust, you, you're the one who chooses who your trustees are. And in that situation, you know that you have chosen people that you trust, or whether it's an independent trustee, it's a trust company that you trust, and these people will do what's in the best interest of the child, and it will not be a difficult process to get those monies to the child's guardian to benefit the child. The other thing that is quite important is your beneficiary nominations on a life policy. And we are all at some point guilty of this until we know better. Because a lot of people will leave their minor children as direct beneficiaries on a life insurance policy. What happens here is that the life insurer is under an obligation to pay the nominated beneficiary. They can't deviate from that, which means that the, the guardian of the child must go to the bank, open up a bank account in the child's name. The life assurer will then pay those proceeds into that child's bank account. But because the child is a minor, they can't transact on that bank account, which means that the guardian of the child will have full access to those funds and the child will only have a right of recourse when they become a major. Okay, so it's important that if you are... If you want your child to benefit from a life insurance policy, then the solution would be that you create, make provision for a testamentary trust in your will, then make the estate the, the beneficiary on your life insurance policy. The money will then go into your estate. The executor will then deal with those funds and transfer those funds into the testamentary trust. But before you do that, you've got to do your estate planning process because there, there must be sufficient liquidity in your estate to cater for all of your liabilities, all of your expenses. That really means that the cash in your estate must be enough to pay off all your debt, to cater for your estate duty and your capital gains tax and any other expenses that come about so that there's sufficient money to go into this testamentary trust for your children. Um, we also need to have a will so that the, the executor is in a position to wind up the estate in an efficient manner um, as quickly as possible to protect the financial interests of the heirs. I think that that's very important. A will just assist the executor with that process. Um, when you are drafting your will, you also need to nominate a guardian for your child. Okay, This is not an appointment. Um, of a guardian. It's really just a nomination. We are saying that if something happens to me, um, you know, my husband has predeceased me and and I would like my sister to be the nominated guardian. Sister then needs to be appointed as legal guardian. Um, the other thing that you can incorporate in your will is any special instructions. Um, for example, a living will. That can all be in your will. Let's move on. 
before you even look at estate planning, you must understand the impact and the consequences of your marital regime. Because when it comes to estate planning and where you are distributing your assets upon death, you can only distribute the assets that you own, which means that if you are married in community of property, the house that you live in is half owned by your spouse because it's one joint estate. And if you don't understand the impact of that marital regime, then you are not on fair footing to ensure that you can do this estate planning. So married in community of property, you know that you're dealing with one joint estate. However, only half of that of those assets you can deal with and you can distribute. Marriage out of community of property means that you have you can only deal with your assets. There's two separate estates. You need to know which assets belong to you, which assets belong to your spouse, and then you are in a position to deal with those assets. You can never bequeath assets that don't belong to you. If you are married subject to the accrual, um, then there could be a possibility where there is a cruel, an accrual claim that is payable um, to either party. So the accrual essentially a calculation that needs to be done so that we can we can see which spouse is going to owe the other depending on the size of the estate. Let me give you a quick example just to clarify. Um, so the accrual system is marriage out of community of property. So we are still dealing with two separate estates. If, for example, husband's estate is worth um, a million rand and wife's estate is worth 500,000 rand at date of dissolution of the marriage, then we've got to now calculate who owes who in respect of the accrual. So husband's accrual is a million, wife's accrual is 500,000, and the calculation essentially says that you must share in the greater, you must share in the value of the greater estate, which means that we minus wife's estate from husband's estate. We have a surplus of 500,000. We then divide that surplus by two. Husband now owes wife 250,000 rand in respect of the accrual claim. If this marriage dissolves, as a result of death, then in wife's estate, that accrual claim is an asset, which means that husband must be in a position to come up with 250,000 Rand to pay this accrual claim. Unless wife bequeaths everything to husband, then that's fine. Okay, But it's not that easy nowadays because we have families that, or, 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 or parents and spouses that are in their second marriage, which means that in some, in some situations, the, the wife might have children from the first marriage. So it's not always as easy as to say, I bequeath my entire estate to my spouse, because that might not be what the intention um, of the testatrix is. So in situations where you are bequeathing assets to other parties, then you must cater for that accrual claim. If husband dies first, that accrual claim is a liability in his estate. So... And when the executor is dealing with the estate, his first job is to pay off all liabilities. So wife is a creditor with all the other creditors. We must settle that accrual claim or else there will not be sufficient funds available or assets available for distribution. Again, it's not a problem if husband is bequeathing his, his entire estate to spouse. Um, so those are the, your, your conventional marital regimes. What about relationships and where does that fit in? And I think it's very important to just touch on that right now because if you are in a in a live-in cohabitation type of relationship and um, you don't have a will for argument's sake, the Interstate Succession Act does not recognize your partner as spouse, which means that if you have lived with your partner for the last 50 years and you have three children and five grandchildren from this relationship, that person will not inherit under the Interstate Succession Act. So you have to have a will or you have to advise your clients to get a will if they are cohabiting. Okay, There's also no remedy for them to claim under the Maintenance of Surviving Spouses Act. 
okay for so for partners that and it's becoming more and more common people are choosing not to get married or getting married much later in life and in the meantime they just live together um, in situations like that then those partners must have wills and they must understand that they are not allowed to share in one another's estates okay so what do we need to ensure we do when it comes to um, our comprehensive financial planning and estate planning the one thing we have to have is a will okay so that's a non-negotiable um, people sometimes believe well I don't have any assets um, so I don't need to have a will the thing is is that you should have a will anyway so that at least when you do get assets and if something happens in the meantime you get to choose who your heirs are the other thing that is imperative to have is a life file it's really just a document holder that has all of your important documents in it. So it has your marriage certificates and your children's birth certificates and your passport and your retirement annuity policy and your life policy and your will. And everything is in one central location, which means that should something happen, then there's one file that your next of kin has available and can give to your executor so that your executor is in possession of all the important documents that he needs in order to wind up the estate. The testamentary trust, it's a non-negotiable when you have minor children. You have to make provision for testamentary trust in your will when you have minor children. Um, your life policies, remember that it's very important that you own the policy that is on your life because any benefit in respect of that policy is paid to the owner of that policy. Um, risk cover it's important that you take care of your body and ensure that if something happens to the money making machine that we can ensure that machine so that in the event of a dread disease or disability that there will be a, an amount that is payable and you can continue with the standard of living that you are accustomed to remember that it's important to have um, a as an emergency fund, a savings fund that is easily accessible, where there are no large penalties that are charged if you access this over the short term. And don't forget your long term savings. Um, and retirement, if you save, the sooner you start saving for the longer period, the more money you will have to ensure that you don't outlive your money. And that is the risk when you don't save enough for retirement. Okay, thank you so much. I'm going to hand over to Ketiwe. Thank you so much, Faiza. Thank you, Errol. That was very informative. Um, we're just going to look for the questions to see if any questions have popped up during that session, which I'm sure they have. Okay, um, so first question that I have, uh, I'm going to start here talking about trustees. Uh, maybe, Errol, you can take that. It says, many women are trustees and beneficiaries of a husband's trust. What happens to a wife upon divorce and the husband wants to remove her as a trustee? Yes, well, well thank you, Katiwa. Well, uh, that's an interesting one. Trust have been under the spotlight the last couple of years. And interesting enough, our law has been shaped to a large extent by divorce cases. Now, although many people have set up trust to shield them from estate duty, it was often done to protect themselves against creditors. Well, I guess you can say upon divorce, the spouse can become a creditor. Now, since the growth of estate is often built up in a trust, it does not form part of the assets in a divorce case. Since both husband and wife will be trustees and beneficiaries in most cases, the easiest thing to do is to remove a spouse as a trustee. Now, that can be done by agreement or in terms of the trustee that would allow that. But however, the real issue is to be removed as a beneficiary, which is not that simple. Depending on how the trust is structured, often beneficiaries cannot be removed. And this puts a spouse in a very strong position, even though he or she is not a trustee. So we find that in many divorce disputes that any trust amendment to remove a beneficiary was recorded, but then when contested was invalid. So one must consult a trust specialist when attending to the amendments of a trust. Remember that people get divorced, not necessarily the beneficiaries of a trust. 
Hope that makes sense, Katiwa. Yep, made sense to me, Errol. I uh, hope that made sense. Um, second question, I'm going to pose this to Faiza. It says, if your marriage is a COP, COP, committee of property, can you exclude the man and can you only include the children in the will? This is from Laura Mdunge. Hi, Laura. Um, absolutely. So I think that it's, it's, it's like I said, when you are dealing with your will, irrespective of how you are married, the only thing that you can... Um, distribute is the assets that you own. So before the distribution even happens, the one joint estate must be split by the executor. So the 100% joint estate, you own only 50%. Husband owns the other 50%. Your 50% you can bequeath to anyone you want to bequeath to. Okay, so you can exclude the husband. However, if the husband was financially dependent on you, he might have a claim against your estate for maintenance in terms of the Maintenance of Surviving Spouses Act. I hope that that answers your question. Yeah, reality is tough. Um, I've got another one here on Wills, but Errol, I've got another one as well here first before I pose to Faiza. It says, I was divorced three years ago and financially starting to find my feet. I was advised to purchase my primary residence in a trust. There's so much I hear about trusts. What would you, what would, what would your advice be? Okay, that's a very popular question, likely. Um, well, the primary reason for establishing a trust is to transfer assets to a trust so that they are administered for the benefit of your beneficiaries, which would include you as a beneficiary as well. Now, think about it. If you have bond payments towards the house, then it simply means that the monies are advanced to the trust. These payments constitute a loan to the trust and they are usually interest-free. In a matter of time, the bond payments may exceed the capital value of the primary residence since a bond payment is made up of interest and capital. Now, although there are very onerous anti-tax avoidance provisions with trusts, which started the 1st of March 2016, and in respect of these advances or interest-free loans to a trust, Trust that house uh, assets as a primary residence, they are excluded from the anti-avoidance provisions. But the interest for giving loan accounts turns nasty if the primary residence is no longer being used as a primary residence in the trust. Coupled with that, upon the disposal of the primary residence, one would fall for the two million capital gains exclusion, and you may also pay capital gains tax at a much much higher rate up to 36 percent now to answer you weighing up all the factors most people will not in the current environment house their primary residence in the trust and the circumstances must be exceptional before i see merit in purchasing a primary residence in a trust but seek professional trust advice before you make your decision okay very important that part, Errol. Okay, uh, third question. Uh, we've got um, one that says, when dealing with clients who have joint life policies, the husband is generally and usually the owner and the wife is the second life assured. What is the effect of a joint life policy on the second life assured and do the policy proceeds pay to the owner or the life assured? Faiza? Um, I think that that question is extremely relevant and we see it quite often in practice. Um, what happens is that there's a policy and the, the husband owns the policy, the husband is the first life assured on the policy, the wife is the second life assured on the policy. Um, they both have life cover on the policy, so they each choose who their beneficiaries are going to be. But they also have ancillary benefits like dread disease cover and disability cover. Now, if you look at the structure of that life insurance policy, it is it is essentially a contract, like I was saying earlier, which means that um, the life assurer, upon death of the life assured, must pay the nominated beneficiary. But if there is no nominated beneficiary for any of those ancillary benefits, for example, disability cover and dread disease cover, who does that pay to? It doesn't pay to the life assured. It pays to the owner of that contract, which means that wife gets a dreaded disease, husband gets the dread disease cover that was, that was insured on her life. Wife, nine times out of ten, doesn't understand that, the, that these are the implications of the joint life policy. 
And I think that it is very important that clients and people generally are aware of that because you could be in a situation where you don't take out alternative risk cover because you think that you have disability cover and dread disease cover. Um, but in fact, that policy is owned by your ex-husband. There's no chance that it's going to be paid over to the life assured in the event of a death or disability. So when you do financial planning, everyone should own their own policies. Yes, there is a space for a joint life policy, and that's, for example, if you want to take out bond cover in the event of death of either husband or wife, it's a joint life policy that is ceded to the bank for security, then that's the space for joint life policies, but not when it comes to ancillary benefits. Um, where you believe that you will receive that benefit as a second life assured. True. Thank you so much, Faiza. Um, I've got another one very important from Bulelo who says, Senate Bank helped me draft my will years ago. Will they be my executor or should I have nominated one in that will? Um, so, so generally, if you drafted a will with Standard Bank, um, the, the precedents dictate that Standard Bank will be your executor. If you choose your own executor, then you would have had to pay for that will. Um, they should have a copy of the will if you have asked them to hold it in safe custody. Um, then you can just uh, request that they that they provide you with that so that you can see who your executor is. Okay. Um, I've got a long one from Smonging Osi. Um, this is about the marital regime that you're talking about, Faisal, saying how common are out of community of property and accrual system marriages nowadays? My observation is that unfortunately partners never ask or consider these marital regimes. From conversations I've had with colleagues, women feel that it is selfish to ask of these questions before signing on the dotted line. Very true. But I think it is, their, uh, it is to their detriment. So maybe you can comment on that, how common these different regimes are. Yeah, I think, I think in the past... Um, and I'm and I'm speaking, you know, 20, 30 decades ago. I mean, uh, two or three decades ago, um, that these marriages were less common than they are now. Uh, as as time passes and people are gaining knowledge, they are becoming aware that there are different marital regimes, and they're starting to ask questions. So they are becoming more and more common. Um, if you get married without doing anything, if you're not registering an anti-nuptial contract, then you will automatically be married. And I think that might be the first problem is because people assume that, well, they can get married and then register an anti-nuptial contract. And, and that's not the that's not how it's done. If you get married without first registering that anti-nuptial contract, then you are automatically married in community of property. A lot of the time it's by mistake. But once you are married in community of property, how easy is it to change? You can't change without launching a high court application. A lot of people think, well, it's fine. I got married by mistake in community of property. Let's just get divorced and remarried. But when you're getting divorced, you submit pleadings to court. And part of those pleadings say that this marriage has broken down um, and, they, uh, and they are no, there's no prospect that our differences can be resolved. So there are irreconcilable differences that you plead when you submit your papers to court. And that is lying to the court if that is not true. Um, you can launch a high court application to say, look, I want to change my marital regime. You've got to notify all of your creditors. They need to consent to the change of your marital regime, but it can be done. So just when people want to change out of that marital regime, it's important that they know that Divorcing and getting remarried is perjury, and they shouldn't do it that way. Okay. Errol, one for trustees as well here. It says, hi, if you're a trustee of a trust, can you also be a beneficiary of that trust? That's from uh, Rosina. That's for you, Errol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm answering it. Well, if you're a trustee, can you also be a beneficiary? Well, look, if you're the donor, and the person transferring assets into that trust, make sure that you are a beneficiary of that trust. You can be an income beneficiary, uh, or you can be a capital beneficiary, or you can be both. Remember, a trust fund is for the benefit of all the beneficiaries, even for yourself when you want to retire and need some of the capital. So in that instance, I often advise people 
to be mommy and daddy a preferred beneficiary so that there are funds available and if they are no longer there then it can go to the children so the answer is yes and i actually recommend that with strong rights okay and the last question that i'm going to post to faiza says i'm a single parent i, I think it says i'm single but i think oh i'm single no kids and own property in my late 20s when is a good time to draw up a will and how often can i change my will as, as circumstances in life change as well that's from pumza hi pumza um yes you should definitely have a will you 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 your own immovable property um so you get to choose who your who your heirs are um you know if, if, if it's your if it's your parents if you want them to benefit or whatever the case may be you should definitely do a will and then when your circumstances change it's very important that you also change your will um, i'm quickly just gonna gonna share a story with you um, i was involved in a matter where um, the husband had passed away and he was in the process of doing a new will the last will he had was a 1987 will that was before he was married with children He's, he's, he was when, when he passed away, he was married and he had two kids and there was no bequest to them because the old will was still available. So when your circumstances change, if you don't change your will, then you could be in a situation that you didn't envisage or you didn't want. Okay. Yeah, I think, um, you know, from a time frame perspective, I think it's important to review between every 18 months and two years. Okay. Um, I've just got one last one here from Rose before we log out. Um, it's asking to explain just what is uh, out of community and accrual. Um, that's going to be a long answer. And if she needs to change her surname, I think maybe she's talking about when you get married, does she need to change her surname? And that's the last one. Yeah. So, so, so basically, an out of community of property marriage. Well, there's there's two. There's in community of property. There's out of community of property. In community of property says that we both own an undivided equal share in a joint estate. Out of community of property, we both own the assets in our respective estates. Now you get out of community of property with the accrual and out of community of property without the accrual. If you are married with the accrual, what that basically means is that. Any assets that you bring into the marriage are excluded from sharing and any assets that accumulate while the marriage subsists will be shared in accordance with that calculation that I gave an example of. Um, do you have to change your surname when you get married? No, it is not compulsory for you to change your surname when you get married. However, when you get married, you do have the option to change your surname when, if you wish to do so, but you don't have to. Okay, hope that answers your two questions, Rose. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for tuning in. There was a lot to absorb. I hope uh, you got a lot out of this. I certainly did. Um, there was a question about will this be recorded? Yes, it is recorded. If you are one of our customers, um, you will get a thank you note tomorrow, which has got a link to a YouTube channel that Senate Bank has a section in, where you'll be able to watch this and see the presentation again if you'd like to. If you're one of our internal staff members, you can get this on their SPFC portal, which you all know. Um, if you'd like to be in touch with their financial plan, to look more into your financial planning, discuss more of the issues that were discussed today. Um, on the thank you note as well, there will be a number where you can SMS and then someone will phone you back to make an appointment with a planner. Or in most areas that we live in, the Arsenal at Bank branches, you can just simply walk in, ask to speak to a financial planner in that branch, and I'm sure anyone will be able to sit with you there and discuss any matter concerning financial planning because we've got financial planning, uh, financial planners in all our branches. Okay, thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you very much, Errol Mayer. Thank you, Faiza Khan. This has been very beneficial. I think it was a worthwhile uh, way to end Women's Month, which is August. And um, even for the men, you can sit and discuss this with your wives, with your daughters, very important, um, with any woman in your life. This makes sense to both males and females, I think. Um, so till the next webinar that we have, thank you very much. Have a good day um, and we'll see you soon. Goodbye.